So, um, so this session is going to be a little bit different. Uh, obviously, it's a different topic. It's Monte Carlo tree search, um, which has a connection to bandits, um, but a somewhat small one. So we'll see that a bandit, a bandit algorithm is going to play a, an essential role, um, but there's lots of other things going on as well. Um, and the other thing I mean I should say is I'm a, a super expert on bandit and a, a little bit less of an expert on on MCTS. And um, well, even though I'm at DeepMind, I, I joined shortly after the AlphaGo success. So I also had uh, no role in that project, though of course I uh, have subsequently absorbed by by some sort of osmosis a lot of um, a lot of the ideas that they had. Okay, so so Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, is an algorithm for uh, learning to play in, in basically two player zero sum extensive form full information games. So this is games like chess and checkers and go. So that's where you can see the whole board as a player and there are two players and, and you both sort of know the rules, you both know the state, that's the, uh, the state of the, of the board. And <clears throat> And, and, and zero sum just means that one player is going to win and one player is going to lose, or, or one player is going to get a certain utility and the other player gets the negative of that utility. So the sum of the rewards is uh, either zero or just some constant, which is just a shift, right? So in chess, one player wins, the other player loses. Um, if you look at games which have more players or they aren't zero sum, then lots of other uh, phenomenon come in which, which don't exist in zero sum games. And uh, well, we're going to uh, focus on games where the players are making moves alternatively until the game ends. I mean, if, if one player is making multiple moves, that's really just one sort of big move, uh, if you like. So it's not a very big restriction. And it's important that there's no hidden information, right? So if you look at chess checkers, games like that, the players can see the whole board and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing secret about the game. Whereas that is not true in some other games. So for example, you have this Strategio game, which is a, a board game where it's somewhat like chess, but players set up their pieces so that only they can see actually which pieces are which, right? And, uh, and, and so then your opponent can't see uh, which, which pieces are which, and they don't then actually know how the states are going to evolve as players need to. Um, so even though there's no randomness in Strategio, uh, there, there is partial information. And then poker is an obvious example where there's partial information uh, and randomness. You know, there's the unobserved cards in the deck, um, but there's also the player's hands, which they obviously observe each other themselves, but not, the, not their opponent's hand. And then there are other games, uh, which sort of you can extend MCTS to quite naturally, um, but I won't talk about it today, which have a stochastic nature. So this is games like, uh, I'm not sure if Kalar does, but anyway, backgammon certainly um, has has this stochastic nature where uh, there are dice involved, obviously, and so the the number of next states or the next state that occurs is going to depend on some randomization. I think Kalar is just a deterministic game; and it should be fine. Okay, so we're going to consider games like this, and the plan is: I mean, I'm going to introduce the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. I'm going to compare it a little bit to some of the other tree search algorithms, um, particularly Minimax and alpha beta and see like how these algorithms differ and why you might use one uh, rather than the other. And then a large part of the session is going to be a practical session, um, which I've never done in a, in a virtual school and not done at all for, for quite some time. So I hope that's gonna work out well. There is some code available to download. We'll get, uh, if, if a link isn't already being given, we'll make sure one is given uh, soon enough. And I, I will try and guide that as much as possible. I mean, we'll we'll see how it goes. I, I hope I hope things are going to go well. But I, I think the majority of the, the time actually will be spent uh, on this practical component. Okay. All right. Um, and the Connect Four is highlighted because uh, that's the that's the game we're going to use to do the practical component. So I need to tell you a, a little bit about game trees. I mean, and this will formalize a little bit more what the setting is. Um, and so, so basically the players are going to start in some position and, and then there's a set of moves um, which they have available to them. Okay, so, so what does a game tree look like? So we've got some root node and 
maybe there's two nodes, two two moves always in in some particular game, and so then there would have be be two branches coming out of that, and then the next players go. This would be the uh, another position on the game, and now we have two more moves, maybe from the opponent now, and then let's just go to depth three, and two more, and so forth, and you get this really big big tree, and and we can mark which players are playing. So let's have a, a black player and a, and a red player. So the red player is, is going second and the black player is, is going first and third, right? So each of these edges in this particular game is corresponding to a move and each of the nodes is corresponding to a position. So this would be the start position of whatever game this might be. Or maybe you're starting in the middle of the game and then it's just some position that you've defreached in the middle of the game. And then we're looking at all, all the moves that the first player can do, the black player, then all the moves that the red player can do and so on and so forth until the end. And in this particular game, the end um, happens just after three moves uh, deterministically. Um, and then we would have utility. Right, so when the game ends, there's a utility. It might be a, a number, or it might just be a one or a loss for for one player or the other. So we could mark it, for example, as um, let's mark it from the perspective of the black player, the player going first. So this might be a win. This state for that player. This might be a loss. Uh, let's say this one ends in a draw, both zeros. This is both minus ones, and maybe we have a one and a and a zero here. Right, so the players take turns. Uh, first, maybe the first player, the black player might go down this path, the bottom one. And then the red player might go down here. And then the black player might go down here. It doesn't actually matter what happens. And then the black player ends up uh, losing this particular game, right? Um, whereas if, the, uh, if we don't another way, uh, can I do these arrows? So maybe the maybe the black player takes the first action, and then now it's the red player's turn. Well, if the red player is looking about what they're going to do, if they go up, then the the black player will also go up and end in the game, get this reward one. Uh, so probably the the second player would be well advised to go down, and then it doesn't matter what the black player does, you get a draw, right? And and so this is a game tree, and the whole game tree specifies really the game. Um, and well, there are a few things uh, that you could say. So one thing is, is this really a tree, right? There are so there are lots of games where you can get to the same position uh, by multiple different moves. So it's 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 completely possible that the the position here is the same as the position here, or something like that. Um, and sometimes it's good to model that and sometimes not. Um, but today I'm not going to talk about that. We call these transpositions, um, but we're just going to treat it as if it's a game where you get to a state and, and that's it. You just model it in terms of the moves that you took to get there essentially. Uh, but it can be, it can be uh, wasteful to, to ignore the fact that it's not really a, a tree in that sense really. Okay. And and the goal of the players is to get the biggest possible score. They want to win the game. In this case, it's either a win or a loss or a draw. And the players uh, want to want to force a win. And they're going to do it by assuming that their opponent plays the best strategy, essentially. Essentially, what our goal is with the MCTS algorithm and with most algorithms that do tree search is to find the minimax optimal strategy. And, and this is defined in terms of backwards induction, and it's a strategy for the players which they can employ. And it guarantees that no matter what their opponent does, they get the, uh, well, that if their opponent is as mean as possible, they get the best possible outcome, okay? You can uh, also ask questions like, if you're playing a, a poor opponent, how can you exploit that? Um, and minimax strategies are not strategies that necessarily do that. You know, you can imagine if you're a chess player, you might know that your opponent doesn't like complicated positions, and then you might guide the position into a complicated position because you understand that your opponent is suboptimal in that sort of game. 
But here we're we're not going to try and exploit that. We're going to be very pure. We're going to try and find the the minimax optimal. And so how is this defined? Well, or uh, minimax search is defined by a procedure usually going backwards. And and so let's do a simple example. Uh, so we have a game like before, just to put one out as a tree. So the same kind of structure. And let's this time put numbers in. So three, so these are the utilities and they're always gonna be specified as the utilities for the first player. So the second player is getting the, the minus of that number. Let's say this is a two. Let's go with a four, zero, 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 one, two. Okay, and remember here we've got the black player going first and then the, the red player. So it's just one move from the red player and two moves from the black player in this game. And, and the way Minimax is working is um, you go backwards from the end is the simplest way to write things down. So you, you look at, at, the, at the leaves first. Well, the leaves, you know what the value is. Right, the value is just given to you. That's the the utility of the terminal reward or whatever. Okay, and so then we go one further back, and we say, well, what is the best move for the black player in this position here? Say, All right. So if you are here, then then you're obviously going to go and get the three immediately. And so we can just say, well, the value of this node is going to be three. Right. And it's very careful, it's very important to remember that you have to bear in mind which player is maximizing and which player is minimizing, right? But the black player we're going to say is maximizing, the red player is, is minimizing. Okay, on the other hand, uh, on the next node, so for this one, you're going to take uh, the max of four and zero. And so the value is four. Here we have value zero, here we have value two. And now we can go back one more level. And now we have the minimizing player and the minimizing player, if we're choosing between uh, going here, so we're looking at the value of, of this top red node and we're thinking about whether or not we want to go to this, this the minimizing, we're gonna go to the three. And so the value of this node is three. Meanwhile, the value of this node is zero. And so then the of the game is three. Okay, and this, this is called the minimax value. And the optimal strategy is just to follow the path that leads basically to get that three. So the, the, the black player is gonna start by going in this direction because that was the action that maximized the minimax value. And then the red player will go this direction because that's the value that minimizes it. And then the black player will end up going and collecting their their score of three. So the minimum max value of this game is three. Okay, and it's not hard to see that the minimax algorithm, I mean, this is really an algorithm for finding out what the best strategy is. You build the whole game tree and then you, you go back using this backwards induction approach. Now, that's not a very efficient way of doing it um, for two, two reasons, essentially. One is if you build the whole game tree in memory, that's an enormous amount of stuff to store in memory, uh, which you probably don't want to do. And, and that's easily overcome, actually. You can write minimax search as a depth first search, and I'll get to that uh, in just a moment when we look at alpha beta. But the other problem is that minimax actually does a lot of uh, very redundant searching in an information theoretic perspective. And, and that can also be avoided for, for completely for free uh, which alpha beta is going to do as well. Uh, but I see there's a few questions. Maybe now is a good time for a pause. We only had one question by um, uh, somebody that was already looking at your code. And this uh -huh. by a TA. And so was okay. speech install uh, color. Okay, good, good. We answer. will get to the code. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, so let me explain alpha beta. And um, I wonder if I can... I don't know if I can copy. Let's just let's just write this out again. Okay, so so let's let's explain alpha beta and how this is saving um, uh, saving an enormous number of nodes potentially, and um, and at the same time we can write it as a depth first algorithm. So the same tree again, same two players. 
and the same values as well. And you know, this isn't super important for, for understanding MCTS or anything, but um, I think it's good to understand what the competitors are gonna do. Okay, so we have the red node it's as before, and we have the black player as well. Okay. So the first the first point is is to try and instead of expanding the whole tree first and then doing something is to do things in a depth first kind of way. So, so the alpha beta algorithm is going to traverse the tree, um, you know, along some path. It doesn't really matter which which route, which order you go first. So I'm going to go sort of from top top to bottom. So it's going to go uh, up here and then up here and then up here. Yeah, I can just traversing the tree out to the leaf along the topmost path that it can. Eventually move ordering becomes really important. It actually matters a lot which order you search moves. You should try and search moves that are good first. Um, but, but for now, that's not important. And now what we're gonna do is, is kind of the same procedure. Um, so when we're, we're sitting at this point, we examine uh, first the three, and we see, well, we can get a three if we go to this point. Uh, so let's just put a three here. And then it's gonna look at the two and say, is that better than three? No, it's not. And that's the end of the moves. And so it has a value for this node, it's now three. And then the algorithm backtracks and it starts looking at the red player, right? And so now we're, we're looking at this node is the one that we're examining, right? We've figured out that the value uh, of one of the moves from there is three. And now we're looking at the minimizing, minimizing players' choices at this red node, right? So they can get a three. Uh, and remember, they are, they are trying to minimize now. And so let's say we, we say, okay, for now we know that we can get a three. We don't know that's the best yet, but we know we can get a three by going up. And now we start traversing down, down the, next, the next path. We have a look here and we're trying to figure out if the value of this node might actually be better than, than a three for that player. And this is where the, the, the improvement from alpha beta starts. Now we keep traversing and we see that we can go here and get a four, right? So that means that the value of this node is at least a four for the first player. Okay, and actually now it doesn't matter anymore what the value of this node is, because even if it's a 50, four is good enough, right? The minimizing plan knows they can get a three if they go up to this, this node here. We've already proven that. We've proven that we can get a three by going up. And now we've proven that if we go down, the maximizing player could give us a four which is worse because we want to make it small. And so we don't even need to look at, at this node that has a zero. It doesn't matter what the value is. It could be zero, it could be 40. We don't care as the minimizing player. We've actually decided now based on just these observations that if we end up in this node, uh, we're gonna go up and get a, a value of three. Right, so this is this is a, 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 the idea of alpha beta, and it doesn't look like a big win here. So far, we only managed to avoid looking at, at one node, um, but it's it's going to be a, a much more significant win as the trees get bigger, and we'll see that in a second. So now now the algorithm is going to go down. It's going to start looking here, and then it traverses up. We have this one as a zero, traverses down, and now. Uh, we see here as the minimizing player, if we go up, we could get a zero, right? So we know that this is at least sort of at most zero, this node. As a minimizing player, we want to make it small and, and we understand that if we go up, then definitely we'll get uh, something that's less than or equal to zero. And now we also know that we don't need to search the second half. We don't need to search down here at all. Why is that? Well, because we know that the first player could go up here to get itself a three. Whereas we know now that if they go down, 
if they take this path, then we can force them to have a zero. So we just know that they're not going to do that. If actually they do, then we have to research it when we get there. But for now, we know that's not a possibility. And so we don't actually have to search any of these nodes at all. Okay, and so you can see here, we've, we've saved ourselves three, three nodes in the searching. Okay, and all of this can be done in a depth first way, as I've described, you're just like traversing along the tree, uh, ordering the moves in a particular way. And you can see perhaps here that it's, it is gonna help a lot if you can search the good moves first, because then the players are going to prove to themselves that they have good moves. And then if you see something, which means that they would just do worse than that, you can immediately cut the tree. Okay, so, so the, 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 the amount of reduction of search is, is about square root. Alpha is gonna search about square root, the number of nodes as many max, at least in the best case. I think it's uh, three fourths if you just move a, order the moves uh, in a random way. So this is sort of the main competitor to to Monte Carlo tree search, alpha, beta, and uh, sort of variants. So there are lots of ways you can modify this algorithm as well. Um, and, and those are the competitors. Okay, I want to say one more thing uh, about Minimax and alpha, beta, which is if you look at any game that you might actually want to play really, uh, the tree itself is going to be much, much, much deeper than you could possibly hope to search, right? So if you have two moves in every position and you have a game that lasts 50 moves, then you've got a tree which has two to the 50 leaves. So, so good luck. Um, so what both of these algorithms do, and essentially what MCTS is gonna do as well, is at some point you stop and, and somehow you try and evaluate how, um, how good is, is a position using a method which isn't a actual utility of the game, right? So you have again your tree, and the tree just goes on and on and on, All right? I'm not gonna draw it out, but you've got a really huge tree. And at some point, you know, at the very end, we can assume that all of these things are finite. If you want minimax and so on to be good, then you should probably assume the tree is finite, but, but maybe enormous. And so what the idea is, is just to say, well, I'm willing to search to depth three, say. And so you cut the tree here, at depth three, and at the nodes that you get beforehand, you have to provide some sort of evaluation about how good that position is. And it's a heuristic, it's an estimate of what you think the real minimax value of that state will be. And I mean, there are lots of ways of doing that. So a very trivial one, um, which the alpha beta implementation in the code that I've, I've, I've written for you does, is it just scores it as a zero if the game hasn't ended there. Right, so you could imagine a situation where some of the states maybe ended a bit early. So maybe this, this state is a genuine terminal state. The game has actually ended there and that's within, your, within the depth of your search. And so you might have a value for that state. Let's say one player wins and then all the others you just mark as being zero. This is a very, uh, a very naive way of doing things. But you can do things in a more sophisticated way as well. So for example, if you're playing chess, your evaluation function might be you know, a thousand or something if it's actually checkmate. And otherwise you might count the pieces in some way. You know, pieces, knights and bishops are worth three, rooks are worth five, pawns are worth one, and you add that up for each of the players and you get a score. Okay. Uh, but this, this, this idea is completely essential if you want to run a search, a, a game tree search uh, in practice on any, any sort of big games. Okay, so this is this is the competitor, and you want? yeah, there is two questions that can give you the opportunity to give a little bit of look ahead. Yep. So we have Th Vaz that is asking uh, what are the relation with the knapsack problem and uh, relation to the dynamic programming principle in general. Uh, okay, um, so so problems like the knapsack problem are. Uh, do, do not have exactly this adversarial flavor. So there's not a minimizing player and a maximizing player. Um, what you have is an optimization problem, which is combinatorially large. 
And this is where an exponential comes from, and that's sort of why it's hard. And for the knapsack problem, it turns out that it's provably hard in the sense that you uh, you can't in polynomial time, at least probably not, uh, unless p is equal to mp, uh, solve this problem. What's what's a bit different, I think, is you know if you look at a tree, a tree is an exponentially large object, so it's very easy to argue that solving a game in a minimax sense is going to take exponential time because you might just have to expand the whole tree right you imagine a tree which has a win in some state that you can force and everywhere else is just zeros it, it's going to be impossible really to find how to win without expanding the whole tree essentially the data is exponentially large so it's not surprising that tree searches are really in the worst case a hopeless problem the knapsack problem is different because the input is polynomially large. So you can just read all the input and then you have to use your ingenuity in some way uh, to, uh, to find a good solution. And it, it turns out for that particular problem, in the worst case, that's not really possible. Uh, but that's um, not obvious a priori, whereas I think with tree search, it's quite obvious that it's a hard problem. In terms of dynamic programming, uh, Obviously, this backwards induction view of, of Minimax is, is, is the dynamic programming, but of the most boring kind possible because it's a tree. Uh, so normally, I think in dynamic programming, I think of something like, um, you know, the classical applications of pathfinding and graphs and things like that. And, and in those applications, uh, there's lots of potential to revisit nodes in your graph. Essentially, you have a tree that you build out from your starting space, but it's going to end up in, in one of finitely many nodes. And so you have an exponential many uh, paths that cross through the same nodes. And dynamic programming is generally going to give you big computational improvements when that happens, and so not in trees. So yes, it's naively dynamic programming, but it's uh, in, in not, in, not in one of the useful settings, unfortunately. Uh, on the second, like if, uh, second one, if you like it, uh, Christian is asking the relation with uh, neural network learning. So both for, for guiding the MCTS and also using the MCTS, well, not exactly sure, but to improve the training of the neural network. Yeah, we're going to get there. Um, you know, MCTS was used by AlphaGo and, um, and is one of the pieces of AlphaGo. And, and you know, the other piece is, is this neural network learning. And the two are complementary, but you can also use the neural network learning in um, in alpha beta, say, right? So if you want to do the evaluation in these positions here before the game has ended, you can use a neural network to do that. And Stockfish, for example, is doing that. So Stockfish is, is maybe the best uh, chess playing engine at the moment. And it's based on an alpha beta search, a very sophisticated alpha beta search, but still an alpha beta search. Um, and then a neural network evaluation. Whereas traditionally before, you know, machine learning got good, this evaluation function would be hand coded by, um, uh, you know, some, some strong players with, with, with good ideas about how, how, how the search should work. Um, I, uh, when I was doing chess programming more than a decade ago, I, I had a friend who was doing this, this learning stuff and um, he was a very bad chess player. And so he, he kept programming his evaluation function that bishops should be on the same colors as squares as pawns, which is a, not a good idea, generally speaking, in chess. Um, and his learning algorithm kept unlearning it and reversing the sign in the, his evaluation function. Um, and, and then he would change it back because he thought it just couldn't possibly be right. And slowly it would learn the other way again. Um, so there are good reasons to have... Uh, have the computers do do the learning, um, but it's you know it's, it's sort of orthogonal to MCTS. It doesn't have to be part of MCTS, but I will explain at the end how how you can incorporate that in a natural way into MCTS. Okay, I think uh, you, you can continue. You have the timing to uh, to respect. Yeah. Okay, so so very briefly, why 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 would you not use um, just just alpha beta and 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 there are a few reasons and and sort of. Some of them are more compelling than others, I guess. So, so, so one reason is it's sort of hardish to make the search really selective. Um, 
And that's important in some games and less important in other games. So, so games like chess, for example, there's relatively few moves in each position, about 30 on average in a middle game position. And, and the other thing that happens in chess is tactics are really important, short term uh, calculations. It's, it's really essential that you sort of search every possibility in the, in the short term because lots of tricks work. And in other games like Go, there's tons more moves. So it's much harder to search in a breadth, you know, search everything up to a given depth. It's a, it's a much bigger challenge in Go computationally. And at the same time, tactics tend to matter a little bit less, whereas long-term consequences happen more. And, and so in these sorts of games, it's important to search deeply in general. Um, and, and this is hard to do with alpha beta. So I don't know quite what the current situation is in Go. I obviously alpha Go used MCTS, and I think that's still the state of the art. Whereas in chess, MCTS and alpha beta are about equally good. Stockfish still uses alpha beta. Um, but possibly Leela, which is maybe the second best programming, is using MCTS. Alpha Zero certainly used MCTS. Um, but so I, I think they're sort of about level now in, in chess. OK, so, so, so enough uh, about this. Let's actually talk about what Monte Carlo Tree Search is doing. So it's going to build a selective tree. So it's also going to you know, recurse through this tree, uh, but not in quite as formulaic a way as Alpha Beta or Minimax does. It's simple to implement. It's simple to parallelize, whereas our alpha beta is actually an enormous pain to parallelize. Uh, this, this is a very sophisticated algorithm to get right, unfortunately. And, and as we discussed a little bit, it's relatively simple to incorporate knowledge um, or, or, or machine learning into, into MCTS. OK, so, so what is the picture? So, so essentially, what uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search is going to do is it's going to build a tree of the game iteratively. Um, and, and slowly increase the, increase the tree size. So, so in each iteration, uh, we start, we have some tree, right? Um, and, and what we do with our tree in the iteration, so let's draw a little tree. It's exactly the same as before, but we haven't yet searched out the whole game tree. So we've expanded just a little bit of the tree. Let's just say here, and we have red player and black player as normal. Okay, so this again is, you know, the current position is the root node, is representing the current position. And we have this tree. This is what we've expanded so far. And at the very beginning of the MCTS implementation, the tree is going to have just the root node, right? And then uh, iteration by iteration, the tree is going to get bigger. So then what you do, there are sort of a few parts. So the first step is to traverse somehow or other to a leaf. So we're going to have a function which uh, maps a node to one of its children. Okay, And somehow or other, that function is going to end you up uh, getting to the leaf. So maybe at the root node, it says, go this way. And then it says, go this way. And now you've ended up at a leaf node. Okay, so we have to specify what that function is, and uh, that's where the banded algorithm is going to come in. The banded algorithm is going to choose how you end up going to, to a leaf. Okay, but let's just say that you get there. So now you've got to a leaf, and you're going to expand that. So there are two more moves with a black player. And, and sometimes in some implementations, you just expand one of the children. Sometimes you expand all of them. Um, but let's let's just expand all of them. And now you just choose one of those two at random. Okay, so let's just say that ends up choosing us this one. Probably should have used the other color. Okay. So this is the expansion phase of the algorithm. So you use some banded algorithm to get to the leaf. And I'll explain in a moment what rewards are and, and you know how, what are the number of plays and things like that. Um, but that's where the bounded algorithm comes in. Then you expand it and, and sort of randomly choose a child. And then we want to have an evaluation for this leaf node. And to do that, we're just going to do a random search until the end of the game using some policy. And 
well, that policy you get to choose and you can be clever about it. Uh, the original version of AlphaGo, for example, did use a neural network to do these rollouts. Um, but the simplest thing to do and the thing which works amazingly well is just to search out randomly. Have just random play until the, the end of the game. And that's, that's what the default version of MCTS does. And it's actually, you can prove that this is, um, this is a good idea. And so this, this creates some path to the end of the game. We're not actually gonna store these, uh, these nodes, but it happens. Just some random path. Right. And again, we've got, uh, there's like a red player playing every second, every second move and a black player playing the rest and so on until you get to the end of the game. And then there's some, some winner or loser, right? So let's just say it's a one. So that's the, the, the black player ended up winning this game. Okay, so this is the rollout stage and that provides you with an evaluation for uh, the, the leaf node that you've just expanded. So this is like the expanded leaf or whatever. And here you have a, a score of one. So the black player won in this position. And now what you have to do is you have to go back and traverse back towards the route and let those nodes know what happened as the result of this rollout. The score was one, right? And so now I have to tell you a little bit about what we're going to store at each node. So, so at each node, and this is just in the main tree, not in the rollouts, not where I have the dotted lines, but in the main, main tree. At each node, we're going to store, uh, well, obviously we need to store the children right, which basically corresponds to what moves are in this position and, you know, what state do you get to, to next. And then uh, for each child, um, we're going to store how many times we, we went that direction. So I'll just call that T of child maybe. And this is the number of times we traversed that node. The number of times we chose that action essentially. And then we'll call S of child, which is the, the score that we got cumulatively when we did that. All right. And this is what the banded algorithm is going to use uh, to make the decisions on the way towards the leaf, right? And then to update it, well, all we have to do to update it is just iterate back through the tree and, and put the results, right? So we can say that, um, you know, if we have this is like a, oops, let's not draw quite like that. Well, I've already called it the expanded leaf. So let's call this, this is our node. And the updating process is gonna be something like while node is not equal to the root, well, we can say that T of node is gonna be incremented by one and S of node is going to be incremented by the result. And that's the result that we ended up getting from the rollout. And so now we have sort of the information that we need to, to build the banded algorithm to make the decisions about what we're gonna make. And it's just gonna treat each node as being uh, like a bandit. You've got a move that you can choose that's, that's your arm. So you've got, a, in this case, two moves in every node. And you've collected the score that you got each time you, uh, you played that action and how many times you've played it. And so you can do that to, uh, to construct what this blue algorithm is doing, right? So, so how are we going to choose a child? So this is the, 
uh, let's call it the expansion function. So what is it going to do? It's going to choose the child uh, at a node as the argmax. Let's just index it by C. And now we have, okay, we want the empirical mean. So that's S of C divided by T of C. And then plus the bonus term, which if we use the same bonus term that we looked at uh, earlier today, could be something like square root uh, one over the two, the number of times, and then a log um, was the number of times that you've interacted with the bandits. So log of, of T, and I'll just write what T is here is sort of the sum over the children, TFC. Okay, so that's the algorithm that you're going to use to traverse towards the leaf. Okay, now is a good time if there are any questions about this. Not exactly about this. So one of the questions was already answered by one, but I, I can raise it again. Uh, so that's about the connection between um, MCTS and bounded algorithm. I read you the question. Why do we use a bounded algorithm to choose the node if the nodes are dependent? Um, so, uh, okay, I, I'm not exactly sure what is meant by the nodes are dependent um, because they're not exactly random. The only randomness really is introduced here by your your policy potentially. Um, or the rollouts, actually. The rollouts introduce randomness. Um, why you should use a banded algorithm is a, a fantastic question, and why you should use this banded algorithm is also a fa fantastic question. And the answer is you probably shouldn't. Um, you should probably do something a little bit different, and and we'll get to why. So, But, but the very basic point is uh, we want to explore these this tree in a selective way. So we want to focus less on children or moves that have been unprofitable in the past and more on those that have. So we have a selective tree that searches towards the, the part which we think is good and, and avoid the parts which we think is bad. So that's a sort of intuitive reason for why we might use a banded algorithm. Banded algorithms do have that sort of behavior. They, they play actions that looked good and they avoid actions that, that looked bad. The real problem with using a normal banded algorithm for this algorithm is the problem is completely non-stationary, right? So if we look at even just the root node, when you start, the root node has sort of no children um, and you just sort of just, you expand it at first and then you just start doing rollouts from, from those children basically. And, and once you've built the tree for a little while, the behavior of what the algorithm does after the root node is completely different from what it does at the beginning, which is rollouts. You know, it starts doing rollouts and then it's, you know, traversing down the tree and then doing a rollout more cleverly and you will get different rewards for different moves over time as a consequence. So the, the banded algorithm itself is introducing a lot of non-stationarity. And so then you might ask, well, <laughs> we, we, we maybe shouldn't use UCB, which is really not designed to handle non-stationarity. And that is basically true. And so what people actually use as um, an alternative, well, various things have been tried. And it's hard it, theoretically to say what you should do. Um, you know, non-stationary bandits are already a little bit tricky, but this is a very special kind of non-stationary bandit. Um, but I think what has stuck as, as what is being used most commonly at least is okay you don't do this argmax thing exactly i think what they've decided on is uh what is it it's the square root sum c t of c divided by uh well t of uh, d plus s of d 
over t of d. So you argmax this thing instead over d. And that's the action that you play. And often there's uh, like some const here, which you tune uh, until your performance is maximized. So you introduce a few parameters and you optimize those. Um, there are lots of sort of moving parts in this algorithm and you can substitute one for the other and still get good results. Um, so in the implementation that I, I gave you, um, well, actually you have to implement this function yourself. So you could choose either of them. Uh, but I didn't notice a very significant difference um, based on what I did. But but I think people have explored it a little bit more in, in bigger games and, and decided that something else is better. So so it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, to, to choose how this should be done exactly. And I think we don't yet really have a theoretically convincing argument about what you should do, but there's lots of empirical evidence one way or the other. Okay, so, so let's see a little bit uh, of, of pseudocode, which is really just sort of the same thing written out. We're gonna start uh, with a completely empty tree. And then we go in iterations uh, one after the other until until we run out of time essentially, or you just fix a number of iterations in advance. And um, in each iteration, you find the leaf, which is where you use this UCB algorithm or some other banded algorithm or some other method of choosing um, which, which node to expand until you get to the end. Then you expand a node. Then you somehow come up with an evaluation of that node, which actually you also don't have to use rollouts here. Um, uh, I think the original version of AlphaGo used a mixture of a rollout and a neural network evaluation, and possibly in Alpha Zero, they just threw away the rollout altogether and just use an evaluation from the neural network. Um, but the simplest thing, which is sort of completely uh, does, doesn't need any machine learning, is just to do the rollout, and then you propagate the results back through the tree, updating the nodes as you go, and then at the end of the day, you have to uh, select a move. And there are a few ways of doing that, right? So, so what you have at the end of the day is you have a root node. Um, so you have the sort of the root node and there you've got this, this, this root dot T, the number of times you played each move at the root and you've got root dot S, which is the cumulative score that you got. And the simplest, uh, the way, and the, the thing that seems to be most effective is just to uh, choose the move that you're going to play as being the argmax of the T, just whichever one you played most using the bounded algorithm. Um, or an alternative, which seems to work just about as well and is almost always exactly the same move, is just the one which gave you the maximum score. Uh, so that would be root, like average score. Root T. Um, if, if you want, you can also do the conservative thing. So somebody mentioned lower bounds, you can choose the move which has the largest uh, lower confidence bound. Um, in, in every case that I've sort of looked at these options, uh, none of them is really any, any better than the other in, in, in practice. They all seem to work. I think I just uh, go for the, the maximizing this one in, in the code that you've got. Okay, and this is this is the whole algorithm, and surprisingly, this is this is good enough for um, for a decent algorithm. So basically, there are just these five components that you you need. You need to find a leaf from the root. You need to expand the leaf, which is sort of easy. Then there's the rollout to the end of the game to get some sort of result, and then you update the nodes on the way back to the root, and finally you choose a move um, from from the root. Okay, I'm going to show you the code in a second, but I think the slide is maybe a little bit, well, let's see where we're going. Basically, basically there's going to be some code and now is a good time, I think, to download that and make sure it, uh, like you have Python 2.7, I think, or three, I think it works for both, uh, and NumPy and whatnot installed. Okay, let's just see what we have. I think. I don't really need to say too much. Okay, the game the game we're going to do is is Connect Four. Um, so I hope many of you will have played Connect Four. So obviously this is a sequential game with two players where you're taking turns to put your tiles into this this board construction. So you've got a red player and a yellow player in this case. 
And the way it works is you take turns and when you slot a tile in, uh, you can see it's going to fall down until the uh, until the, the, it sits on top of another tile or it hits, hits the base. So essentially, even though there are seven by six uh, possible moves, there's only uh, possible circles. There's only seven moves that you can really play, right? You just choose which, uh, which column to put it into and then it falls down into the appropriate slot. And the goal is to get four, four in a row. And that can be four horizontally, four vertically, or four diagonally. So you can see here that the yellow player has, has just one because now they've got four, um, four tiles in a, in a diagonal pattern. So the game has ended as a, it's a win for yellow. Uh, so this is connect four. And well, it, it's known to be a forced win for the first player if you play optimally. It's not that easy to play optimally though. Uh, it's not like, uh, not, not trivial, but it was solved in 1988. And, and the, the solution is quite impressive. It's like a combination of a heuristic, uh, sort of a search, but then a, a, a heuristic arguments to, for why this move or that move can be eliminated and things like that. So it's, um, it's not a completely brute force search, um, but for a long time, it has been possible to brute search it completely. And now if you have a modern alpha beta solver that sort of solidly implemented, it can, it can search it in about about a second or so, I think. Um, but the the Python one that I gave you can't, uh, not even close. Um, but this game does illustrate some of the benefits of Monte Carlo tree search, and and in particular, what often happens is you know you have this board and you get to a position where one player is threatening to create a four if if a player plays somewhere, like if they drop their tile in this column, then you will drop above one and you'll get four in a row, right? So you create threats like that. And then the problem with alpha beta it, without a really good evaluation function is it kind of figures out that it can just delay losing for long enough that the depth isn't reached, right? So if you're searching at depth 10 or something like that, it figures, oh, I'll just play in other columns until, uh, until depth 10 and then at zero because the evaluation cutoff has been reached and, and everything is fine. And uh, whereas MCTS, because it's doing these rollouts to the end, even though the rollouts are random, it understands that its opponent often loses because it has to eventually play into that square. And so it, it captures this long-term effect, which Connect4 has, um, which is not easily captured by alpha beta without some sort of sophisticated search. Okay, so, so now it's time for the practical. And um, here, my plan is, well, I'm gonna show you a little bit about how the code works, like what it currently does and, and what's missing in your implementation. And then I hope there are there are two functions which just have not been implemented in the code that you have, um, which is the choice function, which chooses what, uh, what node to travel to in your traversal towards the leaves. So that function is not implemented. And the other function which is not implemented is the, the rollout function. And, and so I hope that we can implement both of those functions and then you can have a working MCTS player that plays uh, Connect4 at least to a level that, uh, that beats me. Okay, so let me bring up my terminal. Oh, and if there are questions, then I can, I can also take questions at this point. Uh, there is a question that I'm currently answering, but maybe you, you give a better answer than me. Um, Usama Sabri is wondering about the, uh, I would say the, the discount maybe. Uh, so maybe I can read the question directly. The return is delayed in time. So how do we distribute credits for the past and future actions starting from a node? Um, well, MCTS is, is not going to do it. It's just going to roll out until the end and the that result is going to be put into all the nodes back along the path with the same value so there's no discounting happen you could try doing it discounting um, because you might believe that sort of some mistakes were more likely to be made uh, as you traverse along I, I haven't seen anything like that but it wouldn't be wouldn't be a shocking thing uh, to try for sure and okay. Has yeah. a very very specific question that maybe would be interesting for others. 
um, where is the square root coming from in uh, uh, in the slides in, in the in the notes that you uh, you have written like uh, four slides ago maybe yeah so let's have a look so there's there's two square roots there's there's uh there's this one is i'm guessing the one that is being talked about and um an, an answer is somewhat difficult to give so so, so, okay, one thing I can tell you is if you run a bounded algorithm, you know, but instead of using UCB, uh, you use this sort of index. So you use mu hat argmax uh, a mu hat a, that's the empirical reward that you have from that arm at so and so time. And then in the normal bounded setting, this square root, the sum is just T, and now you have divided by T a of t uh, and sometimes to make things work maybe you need some logarithm i can't remember but it's not a big deal um so for this algorithm you can prove a regret bound it's a little bit worse than the normal ucb regret bound you get a square root t regret bound instead of a logarithmic regret bound but sorry, i believe so, and sorry, i haven't seen yeah I'm interrupting sorry the, the zoom uh, label is just on what you have written so it's it's not possible for me to to read anything except the t log ah. at the very at the very end um, okay. maybe if you maximize your 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 slides that that would work yeah i can sorry for the inconvenience no no that's it's good perfect you should be able to see it now okay um so if you use this index, then you can prove a regret bound, a square root t regret bound, not a log regret bound. But what I believe you can also do is prove a, a tracking regret bound of that this algorithm will work on non-stationary bandits. So this, I haven't done the theory. I, don't, I haven't seen the theory. I haven't seen this argument made, um, but I think it's likely to be possible. And so that could be explaining it. Um, there is also a paper which, is investigating all this business, you know, which which index should you choose for MCTS? And I think they point to the original paper and and find some maybe some subtle issues with how the analysis is done there. And even though that does work, I think they argue that at least in some cases using this index is going to be exponentially better than using the other. Um, but I'm not super on top of that. That's a 2020 paper. If the student wants to send me an email or something, then I can dig it up or I can dig it up after the course and, and post it. Um, but I, I don't have a great explanation. I'm not sure a great explanation exists beyond that many things were tried. Okay. So, so let's get back to, to the practical part. Um, and see how things go. <laughs> All right. Um, so I hope you can see this this well enough. And um, <clears throat> basically, what we have is 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 four four bits of code. So the alpha beta is just uh, implementing a simple alpha beta search, which is is fun because you can test your MCTS implementation against that and see how the two go against each other. And then there's this connect four code, which really is implementing a a class that just handles the game for you. So it can generate moves, it can check when the player is one and things like that. So, so, so let's not look too carefully at the code, but investigate a little bit uh, how to use it. So if we import that, um, I think we do something like this. Okay, so I've created a connect for game, which is just a class which keeps track of what, what the game looks like. And I think I can do things like uh, g dot moves, and so that's giving you what moves are available in the current position, and so the columns are indexed through zero through through six for the seven seven col columns. And if you want a little printout of the board, you can do uh, g dot show, which just gives you this little little printout. And to to make a move on the board, I think it should be something like this. So this is making a move um, for a player. And that function is just returning, did that move just win the game, right? So in this case, it didn't, it's a very boring move. Uh, if we do g.show again, we can see what happens. So it dropped a, 
dropped a stone in that, that position there, the circle player. All right, so now we can uh, make another move. Let's put it on top. Uh, do a few moves. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I've really just, uh, the players have been taking turns now putting moves one on, you know, in column zero, one and two and so on. And now we should see that if we if we make a move in, in column three, then uh, that's gonna be a win for the circle player because they'll have four circles in a row at the bottom. So let's just, I hope this, this works. It's terrifying doing some sort of live demo. Yeah, okay, so now see it returns true because that's, that's when the game ended, right? So now if we do t.show, we see that the, the circle player clearly has four, um, four circles in a row and has won the game, right? So the other function which you have access to on the board, which is pretty useful, is just unmaking the last move. Um, oops, maybe it's just unmake. Oh, I told you I wrote it wrong. Okay, so, so that just unmakes the last move, right? So if we do g.show, you can see that. Uh, that position has been undone. We undo a few more moves, then uh, then we're going backwards, right? So it just lets you know manipulate the board, find out when you've won, um, the the simple good stuff like that. Okay, so then um, then we have the MCTS player itself in a testing function, and the test function really is just there. Um, so that you can run the players playing against each other um, in a little simulation. So at the moment it's set up, we've got player one and player two are both being created as alpha beta players. And, and that's initialized with a, with a depth eight. So they're just affixed to being depth eight. Um, and if your computer is a little slower than mine, you could make it depth seven or depth six or something like that, then it will be really fast. Uh, or if it's a bit faster, then maybe you can push it up to depth, depth 10 or something like that. So it's a very basic alpha beta search. And um, as written, what the code is gonna do is just as long as there are moves left in the game. So remember game.moves is returning uh, the list of moves that are available in the current position. Then we're going to just print out the game so you can see what's happening. Then depending on whose turn it is, so this turn flag in the game is either one or minus one, depending on which side it is to move, you're going to call on one of these players to to make a move. And then you tell both the players which move was made so they can update their internal state. And if at some point the game.make moves to the move that was just announced by the player, if that ends the game, so remember make move returns true if the move uh, led to a win, then it's just gonna exit and, 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 and print the board. And so at the moment it's just set up with alpha beta players playing together and that's already all implemented. So we can actually just run this and see what happens. So this is this is alpha beta playing against itself. And, and the, only, the only sort of exciting thing I've done here with, with alpha beta is um, because the evaluation function is just a zero, if it, if it hits depth eight without finding a winner or a loss, then very often what happens is all of the moves at the root have value zero. And so in this particular implementation, just to make it interesting, it randomizes over all the moves which are, are equally good. So it will avoid losing, but amongst those moves which don't lose, uh, well, of course, if it finds a win, then it will try and win as quickly as possible as well. But um, if, if there are a bunch of equal moves, it randomizes between them to keep things sort of exciting. Okay, it seems my computer is rather slower than normal <laughs> thanks to uh, Zoom, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, so let's just kill this and uh, run them at slightly less depth, which will make these players a little bit worse, but anyways. Okay, as you can see now, it's uh, considerably faster. And these, these policies are not gonna be completely stupid. It'll sort of avoid uh, losing immediately, as you could see just then, but they're not that good. And in this particular case, you can see that player one, which is the circle player did eventually uh, make a win. This little carrot thing here just indicates where the last move was played. So in this instance, it was here. Okay, but this is just alpha beta playing against itself. And, and I hope that um, you guys will be able to implement the rest of MCTS and then see how it does against alpha beta. 
And I've written a good chunk of the MCTS code. And that's here. And, and basically we have two, two classes. One is the node class, which is storing the information in a node. So that's like the counts, the number of times you've you know, visited each of the children and the corresponding scores that you got when you did that. Uh, and it also stores obviously the children if there are any. Right, and um, so this, this the expand function just takes the set of moves which you're given to it from the board. And um, well, there are sort of two cases. If there are no moves, then this is a terminal node. The game is, is a draw if there are no moves left available. And otherwise it's just going to set up some counters for how many times or the scores in this case that you've seen uh, for each of the moves. And in this case, the number of times that you've played each of the moves. Okay, and then it creates uh, creates the children, which is just a new node for, for each of the children. Okay, and then, well, the update function is, is, is pretty simple. So the update function is just updating um, the number of times that you've played a particular node. So this is what happens when you traverse the tree back towards the root, the update function is being called on each of the nodes in that path. And, uh, and there it's just updating the scores that you got and the, the number of plays. The only, the only little subtlety here is you have to be careful about, um, about the signs of things, right? So if UCB is an algorithm which is doing maximization, but here you have minimizing players and maximizing players. And so either you can have a UCB that chooses sort of the smallest lower bound in alternative rounds, or which is a little bit simpler, which is what I've done in this implementation, is you just reverse the sign of the scores as you traverse through the tree. This, this algorithm is doing that. And so at any point, a result should always be from the perspective of the player that's currently uh, to move. Okay, so this is the first function that you guys uh, should, should implement. And this is the function which returns an index uh, that is associated with the move that you would like the algorithm to play when it traverses through the tree, right? So you have access to these S's and the T's, and you want to choose whichever move is going to maximize the UCB, or if you want to use the, uh, the, the more modern algorithm that I wrote on the slides, then, then, then you can use that as well. Okay, so that's the first, the first thing that needs to be done. And then we have the MCT algorithm itself. Um, so this is the class which you just initialize, it creates an empty game. So that's what it's going to use to track um, the, state of the, the state of the game. And then basically the interesting parts as well, when it calls act, so that should return a move that the algorithm wants to play. And in this case, it's just going to return the result of some other function, the search function. And the feed function, remember, is updating the state of the player, right? If we look at the test function uh, about how that's being used, the feed, the players are both getting fed the move that just got made. So, so that should just update the internal state of the player. And, um, and that's what's going on here. So it just makes the move. Okay, and then the actual search, well, it's really doing, um, Doing, doing what the pseudo code says it should. So we create a root node, which is just empty at the start. And then we iterate through calling the MCTS routine, which is just gonna do one pass through the, uh, one pass to the, to the leaves, then one expansion, then one rollout, and then one update back through, and then that's it. That's gonna do that iteration number of times. And then at the end of the day, it finds the index at the root uh, that was played the most by the bounded algorithm during the search, and then it returns the, the corresponding move. Okay, and then at the end of the day, it just outputs uh, what score it thinks it's getting, uh, which is some sort of estimate of how, how likely it is to win. Okay, so for the actual MCTS function itself, so this is the bit which is doing, um, doing the expansion to the leaves, and so, so what it's actually is, is a, is a recursive function. You could do this in a linear way. It would probably actually be better to, to do it linearly, but um, I'm so used to writing alpha beta code that I did it uh, recursively. But 
But basically what it's doing, it's checking is a, is a node uh, a leaf or not? And if it is, then it's going to do an expansion and plan to do a rollout as, as well, rather than continue expanding a tree indefinitely. And uh, if it's not a leaf, then it's not going to do a rollout. Okay, so the terminal nodes are those where you know that it's a draw, so we can just return zero. That's, so what this function returns is the value from the perspective of the player of this pass, basically. Okay, then it's gonna call this function, which you have to write. This, this node.choose function is choosing the, the index of the move that it's gonna play next as it expands towards the leaves. Uh, get the corresponding move, right? So the indexes are just sort of, you have the list, there's a number of moves that are available and then the moves IDX actually gives you which move that was. Okay, so then we make the move and if it wins straight away, that's what this if statement is doing. If it, if it wins, then we know that the value is one. Otherwise, if we're gonna do a, a rollout, then, uh, we get the value of a, of a rollout basically. So that's the other function that you're gonna to have to write. And why is that negative there? Well, it's, as I said before, we're flipping the sign every time we switch from one player to the other. And so the rollout is now from the perspective of the next player. And so we convert the sign back to being relative to us. And if we're not doing a rollout, then we just traverse down the tree to the children that we've chosen, okay? And then finally, because this is a recursive implementation, now we're going to unmake the move and update the value, uh, 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 the update the node with the, the index that we played and then the value that we got. And that function is also implemented. Okay, so the next function which is not implemented is this rollout function. And uh, so assert false is obviously gonna cause some problems at the moment. And so what you want to do is implement a function which uh, makes moves in a random manner until the end of the game, and then returns the value from the perspective of the player that's currently to move. So, so a very simple thing which I could do, which would be broken, is I could do uh, moves equals self dot game dot moves. That gets the list of moves that are possible, and then uh, let's go I, uh, move equals random dot choice moves. So this, this random dot choice takes the list and returns a random, random element in that list. So this will get me a random moves, a random move. And then I could do something like if self dot uh, game dot make move move, uh, then return one. Okay, so what would this do? This will choose a random move in the current position. <clears throat> and check if it wins, and if it wins, I return one. So there's one very obvious problem with this, is it's not doing a rollout until the end of the game, right? Uh, so that's, that's, that's one problem. The other problem is that it changes the state of the board, and it doesn't unchange it afterwards. And, and this is gonna, do, gonna, gonna wreck things. So, so what this function has to do is it has to return the value of a rollout, but it has to make sure that any moves that you made uh, while doing that rollout, end up getting unmade. So I could improve this a little bit uh, by saying something like res equals one, res equals zero, and then game dot unmake move, return res. Okay, so then this, this is much better in the sense that the state is now the same as it was when I called the function. That's, that's important, but obviously this function is still not doing a rollout to the end of the game, which it, which it should do. Okay, so if you want to test your rollout function, um, then there's this little test rollout thing here. And when you call that, uh, and there's code to do that in this test.py function. So if you sort of uncommented this, then it would call a, a um, call that test rollout function. That just does some rollouts from a couple of set positions. If we go back and have a look at the, the test rollout function, it's um, it's going to make five thousand rollouts from the starting position, and print out the average result, the average number of sort of wins that you got, um, and then makes one move uh, in the far left hand coordinate, and then then does another five thousand rollouts there. 
right? And for me, I was getting plus one, plus or minus about 0.05, and then minus 0.03, plus or minus about 0.1 for the output. So your, your solutions should give about the same. Okay, so I think, I think I've given hopefully enough information. The only thing I'll say is that at the end, when you want to test it, uh, you know, you can, this is for testing the rollout, but once you've done both and you think you're good, then, you know, you can make player one an MCTS player. And, and then that will initialize the class that you've just implemented and you can see how, um, how your code does. And this iterations you can change from being 20,000. I'm not sure how long that will take exactly. I think it's not too bad. Um, but if you wanted to run much faster just for testing or something like that, you could make it 5,000 or 1,000. Okay, so we're quarter past. And, you know, I have a few things to say at the end, but they're not that important. So I think we should spend half an hour or so um, getting this to work. And, well, I hope the TAs will be able to help to some extent, and I can also answer questions. Um, so please do ask questions if something's confusing. It's really just these two functions that need implementing. Um, um, so for the practical session, maybe your questions uh, would be better in the, um, in the matrix room uh, because in the Q and A's we would have difficulties. And uh, yes, definitely the trees are, are here for, for that. And they are even prepared. They, uh, they did your, your exercise uh, during the night, uh, uh -huh. yesterday. Fantastic. Um, so normally that, that, should, that should work. So for, for the attendees, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, better on Matrix that, uh, than on Zoom. And, uh, and for the TAs, well, if you have some questions that are particularly relevant, maybe you can uh, broadcast them to, uh, to Zoom with a Q&A. Um, I have some questions from the audience that maybe I can, uh, I can raise to, to you, if you mm -hmm. want. So there is an interesting discussion between Antoine Chaffin and Erwan Le Carpentier about parallelization of MCTS. Uh, in general, so I'm not going to re read all the conversation as it is still ongoing. Uh, but yeah, if you want to say something about parallelization of MCTS, I think it would be interesting to. to um, yes, I've read a few papers on on this, and there are there are lots of ways to to have a crack at it. Um, so one very simple way is to do multiple rollouts at the leaves and parallelize the rollouts. So you like collect a little bit of extra data at every leaf sort of essentially for free. Um, and that's that's nice because it's completely trivial to, to implement. You don't need any any mutexes or anything fancy like that. You well, very few anyway. You just spin off a bunch of uh, programs doing a search when you get to a leaf and then you average the results and you you pull those back through the through the updates and you just get a bit more statistical efficiency. Um, the the other way to try and do things is to do things at the root and just split up the root and have a searcher for each, uh, for each move at the root. And, um, and so you basically, you have a separate search for each one. And that's also very easy to implement, but it doesn't share data in the, in the, in the sort of in an optimal way. And then there is another algorithm which works at the tree level. And I can't remember the details of how this works, but um, again, I can dig up the paper and, and post it maybe at the end, but there is a sort of a better way of doing it, uh, which is in a way more similar to what the alpha beta search does. It does require mutexes and you have to be a bit careful to implement it. Okay, we also had questions about the paper that you mentioned during, the, during your talk. Maybe we can collect the, the references and uh, the bibliography and, and post that later. Uh, yeah, exactly. One, one question by Jérôme Renault about uh, are there some known zero sum perfect information games where alpha, beta, and MCTS perform poorly? Uh, well, they certainly perform poorly on, on lots of stochastic pro games. Um, I think the answer is, uh, is going to be quite easily yes, if you have games that have enormous state spaces or en enormous action spaces. You know, it's easy to construct games that have huge combinatorial uh, action spaces. Um, but, well, I 
can I think of an example off the top of my head? I'm not sure. I mean, Go is an example where alpha beta traditionally has worked very poorly. Now my guess is it works quite well because we have such good evaluation functions for Go. Um, That's an answer. Uh, and uh, we, we had a bunch of questions about the extension of MCTS to continuous domain um, that I kept for the end. Uh, maybe you want to, to say something about that? Uh, I don't have any expertise in that. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, you know, the keywords to look for, I guess, is open loop planning maybe, but this is not in the game setting. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what people are doing in games, sort of large extensive form games with continuous actions. I think this would be quite a difficult challenge. Um, you know, really you should do some generalization. So, so, so the problem is in a banded problem, you have many, many actions or continuum of actions and you define a model that lets you generalize between them. And you could certainly try something similar in a extensive form game with, with continuous or very large action spaces. It's just going to be harder to do because it's uh, the topology is a little bit less obvious than it is for um, for bandits. But still, I, I, my guess is you can you can just try that, and then and then the same techniques can potentially work out. But you have to be careful, I think, because you don't want to build a tree which has uh, that you never visit the same node again. But actually, I don't know of an example of a game where people are successfully doing this. But it may be just an unknown for me rather than an unknown for the research community. OK, so uh, there is other questions that are raising while you are speaking, but maybe we can keep that for, for later and, and continue with, uh, with the hands on. So I actually don't know how to see the the matrix. Is there some place I should go to see the questions people are asking there? Okay, that's not something that we, we plan to do, but uh, it, it won't be difficult to, to do if you go to uh, the RLVS, um, you, you have the link uh, to connect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I will directly post the, the address to you. So here it is in Zoom chat. I believe that if you click on this link, uh, you will be brought to the login uh, of Matrix, where you mm -hmm. will have to create your, your account. And that's taking uh, two minutes. I see. Yeah, the, the, the first one, uh, the first continue is the one that you want to, to select. For now, we don't have questions in the in the matrix room. Uh -huh. Everyone understands what's going on.
And uh, here you are. Okay, so you have a question by Joseph. Uh, just say, well, you, you can read it as well. I didn't write down the exact formula for the bandits and cannot find it in the slides. Let's show you. I think asked Joseph. So these are the two choices for Joseph if he wants to look at the, the Zoom window again. So again, for the attendees, you have a bunch of TAs that are here for helping. So don't hesitate, even the uh, slightest problem that you have, uh, if we can uh, smooth that out, uh, really don't hesitate to ask uh, even simple questions. We'll find a TA to, uh, to try to help you and uh, answer it. So don't be, don't be blocked, uh, ask questions, get some help.
I think on tour, I also raised a, a question as this morning by, by Ricarda about uh, uh, the bandit session. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if you wish, that's the, the last one that I, I just posted. If you uh, scroll uh, a little bit upper, you will find a, a beginning of, of a discussion to answer, Ricarda, that maybe you can uh, um, elaborate. Uh, not sure I see it. Mm. Well, let me uh, raise all. Uh, I see it now. Yeah. It's a difference between a square root two in the numerator and a denominator. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the simple answer is the square root two in the numerator would be in the Gaussian case and the square root two in the denominator will be in the the Newly case. And um, basically, it's just a question of the variance. So, in general, the correct constant will be square root two times the variance, um, and then divide by the number of plays in some log. And for a Bernoulli bandit, you don't know the variance because it depends on the parameter, but the largest possible value is uh, a quarter, which happens when the parameter is one half. So, a quarter times two is equal to one half, and that's what that number is doing there. Thanks.
Okay, so you have been able to handle all the situation in, in real time on the chat, not an easy task. Thanks a lot. So we are now 3.45. I don't know if you want me to play the role of the timekeeper for you, or if you are keeping an eye on the watch by yourself. Yeah, I have some idea. Um, yeah, I think I think what I'm going to do now, I hope some people have maybe succeeded and maybe some people haven't got it running yet. Um, but maybe I will just show uh, my solution and give a little demo to show that it can actually uh, do a thing, and and then I'll discuss a little bit more about some other aspects of of MCTS, and then we'll we will be out of time. We, so, so we have some. So I, I don't know if you are familiar with that. We have some polls in a, in a, in Zoom, so you you can. Well, the basic one is: Do you understand very well, quite well, not so well, not at all? That can be adapted to: uh, Are you done very well, quite well? Uh, if if this is useful to you. Yeah, maybe we should do one of these, see what happens. Yeah, so very well if you're done, quite well if you're kind of done, not at all, if, if not at all. I'm seeing a lot of quiet wells. Let's let's have a look at my code and uh, and see what happens. So there are two parts um, to do, and the choose function, I guess, is is sort of slightly easier because everything is already being uh, collected. So we need to return the index of the um, the move, which is optimal. So argmax is going to give us the the maximum of something. And then NumPy is super permissive about, um, about how you can uh, operate with vectors. So here we're just going to divide the number of um, the number of wins divided by the number of plays that we have, and then um, we can we can do something like like this, um, and then <clears throat> T dot sum and that should uh, should be should be all we need to do. Okay, so that's just going to basically implement exactly the the equation that I that I had in mind. And then for the rollout function, it's a little bit trickier. And um, okay, obviously this one is not going to work. And the, the the tricky thing about the rollout function is uh, getting the signs right, especially if you do a um, a recursive definition, which is um, what I did. So, so we can get the, the set of moves. That's the first thing that we're going to do. <clears throat> and um, if, if, if there are none, then the game is a draw. Okay, so that's, that's a zero. A zero from either perspective is, is, is a zero, that's a draw. And, and otherwise, we're going to choose a random move. OK, so that gives us a random move. And, and now we're going to check it to see if this wins. Um, so let's, let's play it. So if that's true, that means that we have one. And so let's just set value equal to one in that case. Um, we have to be careful because we do have to un unmake the moves as well. So otherwise, um, we're going to just continue doing a rollout. We've already made a move in that make move, so now we can go minus uh, self dot rollout, and now we're going to unmake the move. Uh, the last one. Oops, that's not going to work. And then finally, we return the value. Okay, so that's a recursive implementation. It's probably again better actually not to do a recursive implementation, just do it linearly, and then you'll have to be careful about uh, flipping the signs and undoing things appropriately. But this one is 
is quite easy to do in this case. Okay, so I think that should be good. And now if we look at the test.py, uh, I wanna make sure, so player one is now my MCTS player, player two is the alpha beta player. And let's just see what happens. So, uh, oh, okay, I've made some sort of mistake. Yeah, you're missing your S to the moves of random.choice moves. Uh, that Sayeg, like, that is uh, pointing that. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Now we see how long this takes. But I think one thing that's that's interesting, and if this is too slow, then I'll I'll make the iterations less. One thing that's interesting here is this MCTS is, is, has no knowledge whatsoever in the sense that I haven't programmed in that playing in the center is a better idea than playing at the boundary or anything like this, um, but it is. And this MCTS is gonna figure that out. Whereas if you run the alpha beta in this position, indeed this is taking much longer on my MacBook than on my, my desktop machine. Um, if you run alpha beta in this position, then it's going to play a uh, just a random move, basically, because none of the moves lose um, very early on. So let's just kill this and see what happens if I uh, change this to, I don't know, 2000. Python is very slow. So here the MCTS is the uh, is playing the circles, and let's let's see if this wins at only two thousand. At twenty thousand, MCTS uh, pretty consistently beats the uh, alpha beta, and at two thousand, I've actually got no idea. Um, that's that's not very many. Zero point six eight. It seems to be quite convinced that it will, though. But let's see what happens. And as you can see, alpha beta is always just saying the score is zero. So it doesn't really see that it's winning or losing or, or anything. Um, but this time it is playing instantly. Okay, now alpha beta sees that it's losing. MCTS also sees that it's winning. And indeed, uh, we have a, a win for MCTS with these four tiles here. And you can see going back, let's see how long it's predicted it's winning. So 0.98, it thinks it's winning. 0.91, it thinks it's winning. And here it's it's actually not so sure. So so very quickly it goes from being thinking it's winning sort of most of the time to um, to suddenly winning completely. Okay, but this is only two thousand iterations. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's it for the practical. Thanks very much for uh, for working through that. And, and let me just say a few things more about, um, about MCTS and, and what you can do with it. Okay, I can go full screen on this now. Okay. So. All right, so the first thing is, is what can you say theoretically about about MCTS and you know it uses the standard algorithm and we have lots of theory for banded algorithms and um, for for MCTS it's much harder and, and let me just explain the reason so we know that UCB has theory if you have a stationary problem but the problem is that uh, MCTS is very far from being stationary so so the theorem that we have essentially more or less is that MCTS converges to the optimal. I think in the original paper, it's stated in probability or something, but basically it converges. I think it should be almost surely as well. Um, and and they, 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 it's claimed that it is a polynomial rate of convergence. The rate doesn't really matter um, because there are exponentially large constants in front of it. And, and this you just cannot avoid. Uh, it's an exponential 
search problem, like searching a game tree is going to take an exponential amount of time. So the surprising thing is that it is um, that it is so effective. Uh, but okay, the theory is a little bit lacking, and the difficult part is this non-stationary aspect. Uh, and to overcome that, essentially the argument is that UCB does eventually play all the actions infinitely often, just at a very slow rate. And so eventually you can uh, make this backwards induction argument that it searches out the whole tree and then backpropagates the optimal move. So it's a very uh, uh, crude way of proving a, a result of this kind. But okay, it gives you it gives you some kind of theory. And and you know I think the challenge is for new theories to say something more interesting than this um, because MCTS works very well. Uh, it would be interesting to understand theoretically why. What sort of game trees do we expect MCTS to work well on? And I think I've seen a, a very little bit of work on this, but um, but it seems like maybe there's lots to do there. Okay, so this is this non-stationarity is 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 what makes things really hard. It's like you have your tree, you've started to search, and now if you've got some bandit at, at this state here, and early on you're doing lots of rollouts that are close to that state, and after a few rounds. You've explored the tree in some other way, and now you're doing rollouts from different states. Uh, there's no particular reason to believe that the reward from one arm won't switch, you know, from being good to bad or vice versa. Um, and so your algorithm should really handle this non-stationarity, but at the end of the day, you may really have to search an exponentially large tree anyway. So, so this is this is the this is the problem that that you sort of face, and it's the difficulty that you face when you try and use theorems even from UCB and apply them to to MCTS. Okay, we've mentioned a little bit some of the extensions, um, and really, I just want to say that that these exist. You know, you can extend this idea to um, to games that have stochasticity, at least to some extent. And um, and some aspects you can extend to um, games of partial information as well. And so there, the the objective is a little bit different. Uh, you're not trying to compute the minimax value. You're usually trying to compute Nash equilibriums. Um, but um, but but there you can do something. So the keyword to look up there is counterfactual regret minimization. And this also uses a bounded algorithm. It uses an adversarial bounded algorithm. And this is an algorithm uh, that, that you can use to compute Nash equilibriums, sometimes in extremely large games. Um, so for example, uh, solving heads up limit poker with just two players. Well, heads up is two players. Um, you can find the Nash equilibrium of this game with uh, an enormous amount of compute, at least using counterfactual regret minimization. And it's a sort of a similar kind of tree building exercise. Um, okay, and then, then the last thing I want to say is, I mean, obviously combining MCTS with machine learning has been a really powerful tool in, in these games, but particularly, uh, particularly Go and well, I don't have a great deal of time to say how how this works, but essentially what you have, right, is you have a game, a sequence of game states that's produced by MCTS if you run it against itself. So you have some self-play. And this gives you a sequence of states until the game ends. And it also gives you a sequence of policies, right? It is a, uh, at each state that you have, there's a policy that you played. Um, so here there's, there's sort of pi one, and then there's a pi two, and pi three, and pi four. And at each of these nodes, you know, you've done some huge tree search using, using whatever models you have at the moment. And generally speaking, the way the neural networks work is they're used either to do the evaluation in place of a rollout, right? So instead of doing the rollout to get a value, you just use an evaluation function, which might be the output of a neural network. Um, or the other way it can be used is instead of doing a rollout using a uniform policy, you do a rollout uh, using a, a policy generated by a neural network. But, but one way or the other uh, is going to 
be good potentially. And then at the end of the day, what you have is you have a score, you know, the result. And you can use this as a target to train the evaluation of your function, uh, generally speaking, just on these on the states that you've transitioned through the game, right? So you've got you've got a state here, you've got a state here, you've got a state here, you've got a state here. And at each of those states, your evaluation function makes a prediction. And then you can use the result as the target to train your neural network, um, either for the prediction or the policy. And, and this self-play is, you know, you can also do this with alpha beta, um, but this self-play is, is, I guess, one of the things which made alpha zero so effective. Okay, I am out of time and more or less out of material. So I can, I can take some questions. I think that's half an hour until the next talk. Uh, which I'm very excited about. So I hope that will be lots of fun. And uh, thanks again for your attention and I hope it's been enjoyable. Okay, thank you very much. It was a, a great talk and the, the, the um, practical session went very well as far uh, as far as I can see. Um, thanks a lot uh, to the teaching assistant. Uh, you have been great. Absolutely. The version of, uh, of successful uh, uh, attendees. That, that's very nice. So uh, thank you all for, for that. I have um, to say, I, I sent the code, I think, yesterday or something. And uh, no, so I'm very, uh, very grateful that, that you all uh, took some time. To... Yeah, and your, your code is nice. So uh, it's, uh, it's, well, uh, th thanks a lot for all that. So maybe just some announcement. Um, so we are now uh, at the time of a break of 30 minutes before the next session. Maybe uh, we, we can take some questions uh, during this break, but that's, that's just for the point about the time. Um, Tom very nicely answer, already answered some questions during lunchtime. Uh, this question, this answer and these questions have been uh, posted on the RLVS Bandit uh, chat room in, on Matrix. Uh, Sebastian is going to post that again or to, to up the post uh, to, to make that, uh, make that visible. And I think I have a last one. Um, yeah, um, thanks again to the TAs and specific mention to Louis Bethune and uh, Erwan Le Carpentier. We are, we are doing a particularly great job during this session. Um, okay, so that, that's it for, for my an announcement. Uh, we managed to handle uh, more or less all the questions that were raised on, on Zoom and uh, you also, uh, uh, answer all the questions that were on the chat. So I think actually we are out of questions as well. Okay. We have a lot of thank you that I'm cleaning to see the questions. So I think we're done. I think if you want to have some questions, yeah, a, a very last one by Antoine Chaffin, just uh, last time. Um, so I, I just read it. Maybe you can see that as, uh, on Zoom as well. Uh, maybe I can ask again, uh, since you spoke about ML to evaluate states. Okay, so there is the proper definition of my question. The ending score of my state is calculated using a neural network. Hence, it is better to evaluate multiple final states at, at once. This means that I need to expand and simulate multiple times before backpropagating, while the expansion and simulation part will indeed explore different paths. The selection process is deterministic. Thus, I will uh, only calculate the children of the same selected leaf. Does it make a sense? Uh, so, vectorialization of, uh, of evaluating the, the score uh, using a neural network. So you want to evaluate several scores at the same time uh, and uh, propagate, uh, roll out uh, several branches at the same time, several, several, several um, exploration at the same time. Do you think that it makes sense? So, so maybe I'm a, a little bit confused. I mean, I mean, so one one part of the problem here seems to be that if your algorithm is entirely deterministic, you might worry that you'll repeatedly expand the same nodes. Uh, but I'm not sure why this would be the case necessarily. I mean, the UCB bonus is going to um, decrease the nodes that you repeatedly expanded. And so your algorithm should stop expanding them at some point. 
uh, once that falls below nodes that haven't been explored very much. So it, it seems to me that even if you have a deterministic system for evaluation, uh, the algorithm will still explore the whole tree eventually, but maybe very slowly. I do know that some, uh, some versions of MCTS, they do add noise. There's essentially, they use a kind of Thompson sampling instead of UCB uh, as the algorithm, and that obviously makes it more random and, um, and less deterministic. But, but unless I'm misunderstanding something, I'm, I'm not sure why, um, why this, is, this is obviously a problem. Yeah, I'd be very happy. The if, limit yeah. of uh, having virtual questions that are uh, asked, uh, um, written. I mean, until you backproc, will you select the same leaf? That's what Antoine Chaffin is uh, is asking as a, as a precision. Uh, well, then yes. If you don't do any updates, uh, then you will select the same leaf until you do updates. And and so if 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 you really want to delay. Uh, doing those updates, then, then I would try the adding the randomization. Okay. Um, one very generic question is: uh, uh, Do we well? Can we still ask question uh, about this on Matrix? So in general, yes, and uh, we are going to try to answer that. Uh, if you have more questions directly to Tor, I'm, I'm not sure if Tor, you are willing to spend a little bit of time on Matrix, but maybe we can forward mm -hmm. some questions to Well, let, let's mm -hmm. decide that offline. In any case, you can ask questions on Matrix, and we will try our best to find an answer to these questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to look at Matrix until uh, until Don's talk, and then I guess uh, probably I won't look at it again. But if you want to email me a question, that's also fine. <laughs> Um, uh, let's say a, a last question. Uh, well, it's Mark as a last question in any case. Um, you mentioned it during the talk. Uh, those both UCB bonuses for MCTS lead a regret upper bound. Let's say again, sir. Question by Paul, by Paul Daudi. Um, those, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, so I just read it. Does both UCB bonuses for MCTS leave a regret upper bound? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, and the answer is yes. Um, you know, the two choices were this sort of new hat, uh, the normal one. So, so this this sort of style versus new hat uh, plus square root little t over big T. Um, so the first one is going to leave you lead to the logarithmic bounds that I proved this morning, and the second one leads to a square root t, a square root n bound. Um, so which is sort of minimax optimal, but asymptotically not optimal. Uh, I, I don't know of a reference for that result, but it's something that I that I proved at some point for some reason. And um, well, once you know the proof for UCB, it's not hard to to repeat the proof for, for that algorithm as well. Okay, I have, I have two uh, simple, well, not, not simple, but uh, opinions question at the end. I think that, that can be nice to, uh, to finish and conclude. Uh, they are really seeking for your opinion. If you want to increase what, the, what Kirubel is, is um, naming the cognitive power, so I guess the capability of the, of the algorithm, uh, would you focus more on the size of the model or on the art architecture of the model itself? Um. <laughs> I, 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 so, well, both these questions are, are about the evaluation component, so sort of the neural net aspect, if you like. Um, and I have no clue whatsoever <laughs> about the answer, <laughs> I have to say. You would need to ask someone who's an expert on neural networks to. Uh, Okay, the, the, the final one is, is even more opinion. Do you think that a human can still beat AlphaGo? Uh, I think that's pretty clear. No, not a chance. Okay, so that's it for, for this session.